wash, wash, wash your hands, wash them nice and clean. Do you remember that jingle from last year that reminded us to keep washing our hands? Still a jolly good idea. I was reminded of that when I read the gospel set for this Sunday. Of course, we should be cautious in assuming how similar our life and practice and experience of faith today is to those of the first century of whom we read and who have written the New Testament. And yet, it's not difficult to recognize resonances in Jesus' teaching from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, when Jesus responds to criticism that his disciples seem to be a bit lax in the hand-washing department, except, of course, here it's nothing to do with COVID-19, but it's to do with ritual purity. You may think of all sorts of tropes about useless things that religious people do with their rituals. I think our passage reminds us, while all religions have certain rituals and actions that can be helpful in guiding our lives, in guiding us and pointing us to the deeper purposes of life, religions also teach that these rituals, these actions can be no substitution for what I heard an Imam express in his teaching the other day when he spoke of the priority of having a beautiful character, the priority of virtue. Christians might call it growing into the full stature of Christ. In both cases, what is this about? It's about an inclination and a commitment of the whole person towards the divine. To use a simple example, just buying the club shirt doesn't make you a, f a football fan. Just wearing the shirt in itself won't do it. But finding out all that you can about the players, the tactics, the games, and you'd naturally want to do that as a football fan, and then traveling with the team to away games, that's what really makes you the genuine football fan. In the same way, Jesus recalls Jewish prophetic teaching when he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. And then he goes on to say that it is what comes out of a person that is the problem, not what goes in, according to the purity laws. For, he says, for it is from within from the human heart, that all evil intentions come. Of course, the next question is, well, where do these evil intentions, the human heart, actually come from? Don't bad influences come into our lives and it is them that cause the problem? I think the answer is, of course. Yet, when we, for example, blame horrid, violent and abusive video games for desensitizing youngsters, the whole idea of this violence stems again from within someone's heart, human heart. It's part of the human condition, and we find it difficult to accept that every human heart has that potential to be violent, to be abusive towards others. Now, let me address an issue that really bothers me about the way many, and especially this passage of the New Testament, is interpreted. There is a sweeping anti-Jewish generalization in this gospel passage. The Pharisees and all the Jews. Unfortunately, this is all too often picked up uncritically, and it morphs into a generally pejorative stereotyping of Jews. The writer of Mark's gospel, was likely a Gentile, writing any time after the early 70s. And he was a bit hazy, not only about the geography of Palestine, but also unclear about the various Jewish groups contemporary to Jesus, because of course that changed before and after 70. So I think Mark's gospel is historically mistaken. Only a small number of Jewish people in Jesus' day would have done all that hand washing. The purity laws mainly governed access to the temple, not to table fellowship. 
And the Pharisees in many ways overlapped with Jesus as lay interpreters of the law, trying to spell out what it really meant to be a faithful Jew in real, everyday life. So this rather crass polarization of Jesus on one side, the true teacher of God's grace and love, and on the other, Pharisees seen as petty, obsessed with ritual detail and essentially teaching justification through works. This polarization is a hideous misrepresentation that nonetheless keeps getting reiterated. This, together with depictions of Jesus' death caused by obeying Jewish crowd, etc., etc., has generated zillions of sermons with an intensely anti-Jewish sentiment and mentality, the effects of which culminated in the concentration camps of the last century and continue to feed into a wider anti-Semitism today. Finally, I love the Bible. I love the New Testament. I love the Gospels, unique in every way, including historically. So I don't believe there pertains a metaphysical property to biblical texts that it would enable us to engage with these texts seriously without bothering with their unique historicity, without employing the tools of scholarship at our disposal. On and off, some of this is what I have tried to share in these reflections over the last year and a half. And I hope it might have been helpful if you've been preparing sermons, reflections, addresses in any way. My prayer is this. Faithful Creator, whose mercy never fails, deepen our faithfulness to you and to your living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, after the many pictures of churches which I have shown you at the end of the video, we briefly pop into Combatant Church for this lovely tableau by a local artist to remind ourselves that being the church is about being living stones. And for the collect, we go to the mother church of the diocese, Ely Cathedral, and gaze up into the octagon, which I think wants to tell us that in all our joys and trials, we are part of a vast community of Christians before us and beside us. So let us pray. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself. Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you. Through him, who is lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we say, so we say goodbye.